Knowing God's will. You know, as a pastor, one of the questions that we get most often is, how do I know what God wants me to do? A lot of people are coming asking, how do I make godly choices? How do I know God's will for my life? How do I make decisions that are going to honor Him? And a lot of people come as Christians with those questions with a little bit of trepidation that maybe I'm going to get it wrong. Maybe I'm going to blow it in God's will. How do I get this right? And a lot of those are everyday decisions, and a lot of those are really big decisions. So I hope today as we come in God's Word, we can bring clarity to that in a simpler, straightforward format. Well, let's just dive right in and think about the question. People are coming and want to know, what is God's will for my life? Well, we start with the idea that God has a will. That's very amazing for us as Christians and people who know the Lord. Because what we're not saying is, I'm going to a counselor for good advice when I pray or when I seek God's will, or I'm not going to just someone who's very enlightened more than me, someone who has gone before me with more experience and asking God, what would you do? What do you suggest for me? What we're doing is going to God saying, God, you have a will. You have a will for my life. You have a will for your people, the church. And we're saying that God has a will for all of the universe that God is acting with his sovereign providence over all the affairs of mankind through all of history and throughout the cosmos. God is orchestrating and organizing things based upon his will. And his will is always going to be done. So really when we come to God and we think about what should I do, what we're not asking is give me a better choice or give me the choice that's great for me, but we're saying, what is your choice? What is your will that you've already decided? Would you reveal that to me? And that brings us to the first way of coming with clarity to know God's will for your life. You start with what he has already revealed. You can call this his revealed will. And God has said so much in his scripture, the Bible, about what he does will for our lives. And these are the things that we should major on. If you have your Bibles, Psalm 119 is wonderful, but just take a look at a few of the verses from it here. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, whose choices, whose life, whose way is the way God wants it, who walk in the law of the Lord, the things that God has revealed that please him, that he desires, that he finds good for us and that glorify him. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping with your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart. And when I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you and displease God that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes, your ways, your will. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And here in the psalmist is in love with God's word and seeks God's word, his will, his revealed will to us about what God wants. Do you want to please God? Do you want to make godly decisions? Do you want to make sure you're making good choices? Follow God's revealed will, what he wants us to do. Does God's revealed will captivate your heart? Does it motivate your life? Is it shaping you in the way that God thinks in wisdom and discernment and understanding 
of God's big things in life and what he is after, what pleases him, what's good for his people, what brings glory to him. Most of us spend an inordinate amount of time trying to make our choices and get our choices correct and asking God, which one, which one? But we see here the psalmist is majoring on God's will. It says, you've already said these things to us. Give me the ability to do them. Teach me your ways. Let them be my motivation in my life, which you've already said. God's word has revealed to us so much about what he wants us to do with our lives, what he wants us to spend our time and energy, our thoughts, our money doing. God's word has taught us how to relate to government and relate to money, to relate to each other, how we should treat sex, how we should be married, how we should parent our children, how we should make godly decisions as a church, how we should choose leaders, how to live righteous lives. God has said so much in his word revealing to us about what he wants. A good way to make godly decisions is start and major on those things that God has already clearly said. Sometimes I know that that's not as attractive. We want individual words from God. But as Christians, we are communal people and God has given these words to all of us. Many of us beg for secret knowledge or a special revelation while ignoring God's clear revelation that has come to all of his people. And we can encourage each other to follow these main and plain things of God. You know, that brings us to a point about knowing and doing God's will. You think about what is the major thing that God wills for your life? What's the major thing he wills across scripture? It's salvation. His major will is that you and I would believe in him, would trust him, would follow him. God the Father's major will is that we would believe in the Son. The Son's major will is that we would have faith in Him and therefore receive eternal life, be indwelt by God the Holy Spirit, be united to Christ, follow Him, love Him. And as the psalmist said here, find joy in keeping His word, knowing His word and doing it. It brings me to think in my own life when I'm making decisions, if I want to know what's wise and godly and how to choose, I ask, am I making gospel-focused decisions? Decisions with Jesus at the center. That might not apply to every little decision I make, but the thrust of my life and the big things that are going on, how is it shaped and centered by a love of Jesus? Not just am I making decisions to evangelize people, but In all of my decisions, a good question to ask is, how is this helping or hindering the gospel? How is this promoting the gospel? What ramifications does this have for my relationship with Jesus and his people? What is this doing to promote Jesus? And all my decisions and all my decision-making process and all my worries of getting it right, am I asking some of the big questions like, is my heart dependent on God? Am I humbled to know his way? Am I interested mostly in following what he wants and not what I want? Are my decisions really being shaped by bringing glory to God? Am I deciding things with Jesus as the focus and the center? Am I motivated and making choices amazed by the grace of God. I think those will help us make godly decisions. Make decisions in view of God's plan of redemption of the gospel. And to whatever degree that you can, make choices asking what ramification does this have for my relationship with Jesus Christ. Start with God's revealed will. Major on that that God has told us so many things to pick up our cross daily, to make disciples, to live lives of holiness, to worship him with our heart and our mind, all of our energy and all that we are, and so on that God has already clearly told us. Spend a lot of time doing that and making those decisions. Well, as we go on to think about what about how do I make decisions that 
aren't in black and white in the Bible? How do I maybe choose which car to buy, which job I ought to take, what person I should marry, where my kids should go to school, maybe other financial decisions, health decisions, personal decisions. Even right now, people wondering, should I get a vaccine or not? Or how do I, how do I roll with COVID happening? Well, the good thing to know is that there are things that God doesn't tell us in his word, but he does desire for us to know his will. We can, we can know some of the things that God has not yet revealed. We can call this his concealed will, his will that he has, but is yet unknown to us. Uh, if you look in the Bible, there's other times that people are looking for those decisions and they're seeking the Lord for those. Should we go to battle, Israel's asking. The 11 apostles after Judas are asking Jesus, who should we choose to be Judas's replacement? They're looking for God's concealed will. They're looking for the details that they're not going to find in the Bible. It happens to all of us. I think the first major thing to think about is that we need to look for God's concealed will through his revealed will. As when we look at the Bible and we know the way that God thinks, when we get understanding the heart of his law, the motivation behind his law, God shapes us to be wiser people who grow to think like him and act like him. And I think that as we don't know an answer to a particular choice, we look at God's word for what he has already said as the lens through which we make decisions about things he hasn't yet told us. We looked in God's word to find the parameters of our decision, to set the boundary lines and kind of limit some of the options. So when I look in God's word, I don't need to spend much time debating with God, should I date this non-Christian or this Christian? Well, God's word has been clear that we should not be yoked with unbelievers. So I don't need to spend time doing that. He's already helped me with the parameters. In the case of those 11 apostles in Acts chapter 1 who are finding a replacement, they look at God's word, they find the qualifications of the apostle they should have, and it limits their choices. They let God set the parameters. Most of us get in trouble because we make our own parameters and our own boundary lines, and we start to decide what we think is important for the choice and the factors. When we can go to God's word and see the heart of what he's expressing to know some of the boundaries, some of the limits that will help us think about the choices that we are making. So start in God's revealed will. And the third one is that we are in prayer. Once you've looked at God's revealed will and you've used God's revealed will to understand his concealed will, to build parameters on your choices, to narrow things down, so to speak, well, then we go to the Lord in prayer. Let's say that you were interested in two different women or two different men for marriage, and they fit all the parameters in God's revealed will about what a marriage should be like, what a spouse should be like. And you've used that revealed will to understand some of the things that God might not have said as clearly in the Bible, some of the intangibles about these people, their character, their heart, their love of God their devotion to him, their sacrifice for him. You've, you've looked at those things in scripture and applied it to people, and you're still down to people who are too evenly matched. Which one is it? Are you going to be out of God's will for choosing either one? Well, if they both fit in God's parameters, then either one would be a God-glorifying choice. You've looked at his words, you've discerned it. And then the thing that we do is we take it to prayer. That's what those 11 apostles did again with Matthias and Justice or Joseph. They took them both equally qualified, fitting God's description, discerning this through his word. And they take it to God and say, what is your choice, Jesus? What do you want? You know all things in people's hearts. You can see through these two men. Which one do you want? A lot of times, dear ones, we take our choices to God, and we say, God, which one of these would be better for me? And what we try to do is to get God to rubber stamp our own ideas so that we could feel like we have more peace about it. 
What we need to do is take two choices that fit God's parameters already, that fit in his revealed will, and then say, God, this is your choice. Just tell me which one you have chosen and then help me obey that. So we go to God in prayer. The next component of that is it's a good idea as you go to understand God's revealed will, as you use it as a lens, and as you go in prayer, that you do so in community. Now, I know in the Christian life, sometimes this can be manipulated and abused, and we don't need a whole group to make all of our individual decisions about following God and living our lives. But dear ones, as you follow Jesus Christ as a disciple, it's a humble, good practice to go to other believers and say, does this check out with you? I want to invite you into my decision. I want to invite you to help me pray about this and pray with me, not just to give me your wisdom or your advice. Sometimes that's a good thing to do with a godly friend, but to say, would you come seek God's choice with me? Would you partner with me? I trust you. And would you come and pray with me? And I think it's a really good practice to have to say, maybe my thinking is off. Maybe I've got the parameters wrong. Maybe I've misapplied this. Humbly, would you help me understand? And what you're really asking there is for them to pray with you because they too have God, the Holy Spirit, indwelling them. And so what we're asking is that God would confirm what he's saying to both of us, that there would be a multiple witnesses to what God decides, that people can say, yeah, I believe I'm hearing the same thing from God. That's the great resource we have in this decision-making process is God indwells us now. And so God, the Holy Spirit, we're asking, will he make God's choice clear to us, understandable to us, and doable for us that we could follow it? And when we pray with other people, who also have the Holy Spirit, we're saying, I I hope that you will be able to amen what God is saying and that we can be in agreement in one accord. And that should give us confidence. The last part of that, I believe, as being a faithful Christian is that once you've done all these steps, you've searched God's word, you've searched his word for to reveal his concealed will, to build parameters and choices and boundaries and wisdom, then you've taken it in prayer and you've been in community. The last thing, dear one, is that you just go in peace with it. You go in peace and you obey. I don't think you need to spend a lot of time after that hemming and hawing about making the right decision. I think we always need to be willing to change. We need to be willing to say, maybe I misunderstood that and God, tell me if I'm off. But if you've had that decision from God, I think when it meets all those criteria, you can go in peace. I think what's dangerous in the Christian life is when we face obstacles and hardships because of a certain decision, we can misinterpret that as not being God's will for our life. Well, dear ones, when you look at scripture, many of the saints that have gone before us, when they follow God's will for their lives, they face obstacles, they face persecution, they face doubt, they face trials and tribulations, they face suffering. Just because we suffer, just because things get hard, just because things aren't the way we want them to be doesn't mean that the decision to follow God has been incorrectly understood by us. Don't let our emotions or our situations dictate that. Look back to the wisdom of God. Have you done all these things before God? Well, then I believe the Lord God is glorified and honored that you have made a decision based on his will and wanting to know his will then we can go in peace that we've done our best to our ability to follow God's will until he clearly shows us otherwise. You know, that brings us to really where the rubber meets the road in a lot of this. It's one thing to know God's will. It's another thing to actually obey God's will. You know, when people are making a decision to know God's will, really the actual harder part is that will they follow it? When God has clearly given his will, what he really desires is that we go ahead and obey it. We heard that in Psalm 119, 
And we see it throughout Scripture when people know God's will, He calls us to, do, to follow it. R.C. Sproul makes a very good point here that most people are concerned to know God's future will when they're praying about His concealed will. Which one will happen? Which one should I choose? Which decision will we make? A lot of those are, are godly things. Again, and we see that in the Bible. People are looking in the future to find, God, what choice should I make for tomorrow? But so much of God's will that he wants has already been revealed, and it really takes place in the present. He wants us to obey today what he has already said. In Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus gives the famous parable or description of the wise and the foolish builders. And what Jesus says is, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Many of us want to hear Jesus's words. Jesus says, I want you to hear them and then do them, to be doers of God's will. He says he wants to reveal that to us and share it with us. I find that in Knowing God's will, the more difficult part is a constant battle that I want to do my will instead of God's will. And I can spend time wondering if it was clear enough or I heard him because it's kind of a subconscious excuse where I want to continue to follow my own will and push off doing his will. But God has told us so much that he wants us to do and he's given his spirit to us so that we can get on with it and do it. Our great prayer as a disciple should be, God, thy will be done in my life. Not just that I know thy will, but thy will, you will accomplish it through my life. Empower me to forgive. Empower me to follow. Empower me to worship you. Draw me, Lord, to know your will, to love your will, and that you will make it possible that I can follow it. If you have your Bibles, I want to finish by pointing you to a one passage among many that I find helpful here. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writing to the church there. And in verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord, Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Paul's great urge is that you would obey, that you would live this out, church. He says, why should you believe this? Because it's the revealed will of God. How do you know? Because we got this from the Lord Jesus. You know how you ought to walk to please God. It reminds us of the psalmist's words in 119. He wants to please God by following his law. Paul's writing to this New Testament church saying, you know how to walk. Jesus has told us and to please God, to do his will. And you're doing it, so keep on doing it. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. What's great? God's great will for your life? Holiness. What does God desire for you to be and to do and to think? Holiness sanctification, that you will be saved in Jesus Christ, his great will for you, and that you will be conformed in Christ's likeness to the character of Jesus. As you spend your time wondering, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? The main thing is, is this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you grow in dependence on God, holiness in God, worship of God, enjoying God, that as he removes the shame and the sin and the power of that over you, that you walk in his ways. He says, what is part of that sanctification, God's will, is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. 
God's great will is that you walk in his ways. These aren't the words of men, but of God. Let us not disregard God's will, but walk in it. And how is it possible? Because we have been given God, the Holy Spirit, who indwells us, Paul writes. And here's some more of the positive side of that. Verse 9, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God. God's will has been made clear to you to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk, may live properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Then he goes on in verse 13 to give the great why. What's motivating our life? The gospel, our salvation in Jesus Christ. How can we live this out? By the gospel that the resurrected Jesus has given us his spirit. What are we looking forward to and how do we make decisions in light of what? In light of Jesus is coming back, in light of his return. So we have today, what decisions will we make that glorify God, that extend his gospel, and that bring peace to our lives and those around us? Let those things shape the gospel. Let's shape our great decisions to follow the gospel as we discern God's will. Look at his revealed will, seek to know his concealed will, and through it all, do the things that glorify God. His great will is for our holiness. Thanks for being with us. I hope this helps us all continue to encourage each other to make decisions that are godly. Go in peace.